graduate studies. The two of them are going to talk respectively about uh, test optional in the undergraduate and graduate spaces. To give you an idea of what our plan of action is today, how we're going to broach this topic, uh, roughly the left-hand column here is uh, the undergraduate side and the right-hand column is the graduate side. But we'll, we'll start off with a little bit of a, a national picture of how we got here and, and why Pitt has made the decisions that Pitt has made uh, with respect to test optional. Uh, Kelly will be talking about the process at Pitt, what changes we needed to make to accommodate this, what some of the numbers look like, how this might impact us moving forward. Uh, then I'll, I'll jump in and talk about what sorts of supports we're trying to put in place to help our students be successful uh, as we move into essentially a new era of admissions in the undergraduate space at Pitt. Uh, and then Amanda will come in and talk about what's been going on in the graduate space, national trends with respect to the GRE. It turns out that Pitt uh, got a bit of a jump start on the graduate side with respect to uh, test optional. So she'll talk a bit about the approach there and changes that have uh, come along in the graduate space in terms of how we do holistic admissions um, and how we're supporting our, our programs and faculty and students uh, to be successful in this new arena of test optional. So with that, I will move to Kelly's slide and have her step in. Perfect, thanks Joe. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the process for the undergraduate students, specifically at the Pittsburgh campus, but we did go test optional at all of our regional campuses as well. So this general concept really pertains to all of our campuses, but some of the data I'm going to show you is Pittsburgh campus specific. I just wanted to make sure I started out with that. Um, so the first question is, why now? Why did we go test optional now? And I think it's no surprise to anyone with all of the, with the pandemic, we had a huge problem with test centers in, in particular, closing. Um, students would show up the day of an exam to find a note on the door, sorry, this test was canceled. By the way, you could go down the street to that one and they would go to two or three test centers in one morning only to find that they all had been closed. Students just could not take a test. Um, just to kind of um, give you a visual of this, I, I put um, test setters and pandemic and had way too many articles pop up to even fill the screen. Um, so it had been something we were thinking about for a while. Um, the, the tests have some biases and some challenges that we'll go into later. And the conversation of how important should these tests be in the admissions process has been a conversation we've been having for a while. It just got fast-tracked due to the pandemic. Um, but we wanted to make sure that no student was denied the opportunity to be considered for admissions, particularly in light of the ongoing challenges to the SAT and ACT centers. So this, this really gave us the opportunity to kickstart a conversation we've been having for years. Um, like I said, the tests, in particular, it was an access issue, issue for us. Ethnic, racial, socioeconomic, um, lower income students were not having even an opportunity to, to leave their particular area and, and maybe go and test somewhere where a test might have been available. We were just speaking to a high school counselor in the LA region um, and his students were, were rather wealthy. And he said they were getting on planes and flying to test centers in Vegas or flying to test centers in Arizona because they knew they were open and their families had the means to get them there thinking it would give them a competitive advantage. So we wanted to make sure everyone knew there was no disadvantage to applying with or without a test. So will you flip to the next slide? So this is just a really quick snapshot of, of sort of where we are this year with our test optional applications. We are still accepting applications um, and we are still making admissions decisions. Students have until May 1, once they're admitted, to decide if they want to join our first year class. Um, so there's still lots of work to do. So this was a snapshot as of yesterday or, or the day before. But generally, it gives you a great idea of that, you know, 46% of our students are choosing to apply without a test score. 
th that says a lot. You know, we we knew students would take us up on the offer, but we we were a little bit surprised when the numbers came in as high as they did. Um, some of the students did have an opportunity to test maybe in their junior year. And, you know, we've seen students take a test junior year and, and apply with just that test. So, you know, we were um, a little bit nervous um, and excited all at the same time when we start seeing the number of students applying without a test. It, it really, um, forced the admissions office to say we need to change our process you know we were always a holistic review process we took a look at all things and the test score was always only one part of the process um, we knew the challenges the test had in particular um, with the ethnic and racial biases and we've always taken that into consideration but it always was at least a data point in order to um, review applications. And when that came out of the process, we had to say, OK, we need to make sure when we're admitting a student, we're setting them up for academic success. What We no longer have that data point. We do have the high school transcript. We do have the strength of curriculum. We do have their GPA. But there are thousands of high schools across the country and the world, and every single one of them has a different grading scale. So an A at one school is that the same as an A at the other? So we, we needed something else besides that high school transcript. If you were to apply with a test score, you didn't have to submit any other supplemental information. But if you were choosing to not apply with a test score, then we wanted you to submit something else. We wanted you to submit um, a personal statement or answer the short answer questions that we provide on our website, submit letters of recommendation from key teachers, counselors, employers that really know you because what we were really looking for is those right fit students at Pitt. I know um, Joe's going to talk later about um, retention and student success, so it's it's our job to to bring them in with with the um, thoughts that they are absolutely going to be successful here at the University of Pittsburgh. As you'll see, um, the admit numbers in most of the category are slightly lower than the application numbers. We are still reviewing. We got thousands of applications in a short period of time. So when all is said and done at the end of the cycle, we really expect the percent of students who applied test optional to be reflective in the number of students admitted. Um, as you can see with our, in particular, our underrepresented minority populations, they are really taking advantage of the opportunity to apply without the test scores. And you can see by the percentage, percent of admits, students aren't being held um, in a negative light because they aren't supplying those test scores. And, and that is a question we were getting continually from counselors and students. Um, like I said, we made some changes to the process. We are including a lot more supplemental information, which is really the exciting part for the admissions committee because we feel we are truly learning a lot more about these applicants. But with all good things comes a couple challenges that um, have me up at night. Yields, um, how, how do we predict? You know, we have to admit a certain number of students to bring in our first year class of about 4,300 students across five first year admitting schools. Um, it's a little bit scary to say that 50% um, possibly of our students aren't going to have a test score, which is a pretty big data element in our predictive models in the past. So we are absolutely trying to figure that out. Um, also a challenge when it comes to yield is we don't know how many other school students are now applying to because they don't have that test score. We have heard from some of our colleagues at, at selective publics and privates that their applications have gone through the roof since they allowed students to be test optional. Um, we the, On Twitter just recently, there was a, a young lady who posted, I just got admitted to 50 schools, 50. And she put the, um, the logo of all of those 50 schools. Now, that student probably in the past would not have applied to and been admitted to 50 schools. Um, being test optional has opened up a lot of doors, so in turn we have to figure out what that means in our models. Um, retention, again, we, we don't know. Um, we just have to hope that we're making the, the best decisions and support. Um, and, and a last thing that I'm going to say before I hand it over to Amanda is 
one of the things that we use test scores for is to purchase names of students who might potentially be a good fit for the University of Pittsburgh. So we purchase their names as sophomores, juniors, and even seniors, and we add them to our prospect pool, and we start marketing to them. In times when it's safe, we invite them to come and visit campus. You know, without the pools of students, because they're no longer taking tests, we have to go to new sources to purchase these names. So, you know, I, I worry about, you know, we have a strong pool this year, but that's one of the things that as we're building pools for future classes, we have to keep in mind. So that's kind of a brief summary of what we're doing on the undergrad side. I'm happy to answer any questions um, when we're done with this presentation. Amanda? Or Joe, I believe, you're next. <laughs> yeah, actually, Kelly, I, I'm the one to jump in. Uh, but as, as Kelly just mentioned, we certainly are going to leave plenty of time for questions at the end. Um, but I, I want to talk for a minute about uh, the fact that we might have a slightly different um, matriculation pool come the fall. Right? Pitt has, for a number of years now, focused very strongly on uh, access and affordability. And so our population of undergraduates on the Pittsburgh campus has been evolving. Right. And and along with that evolution, there's certainly been um, an evolution of the supports that are available for those students. One thing I do know for a fact is that Kelly and her team do a fantastic job. The Pitt students that do matriculate are always incredibly talented, uh, regardless of their background. And so we're certainly not um, we're not looking to be introducing, you know, remedial uh, supports for students. We really want to meet students where they are and, and figure out how we can make each of these brilliant young people that, that Kelly brings to Pitt uh, help them to be as successful as possible. Uh, a quote that the Provost Cud shared early on in this process when we were going to uh, move to test optional is that when we admit, we commit, right? So I, I'm very inspired by the focus on student success that we've had in recent years. And, and this is really just some discussion of how we're going to double down on that, right? So in our discussions, really the main issues for support and success, success that we came up with is, is things like the imposter syndrome, right? Sense of belonging that students that would be from a sort of atypical background relative to uh, traditional Pitt students. We want students that come to Pitt to feel like they belong. So we need to address that psychosocial support. Uh, some of those students are going to be coming from high schools that were less resourced. And so they might not, for example, have been trained uh, well in study skills. They have all of the necessary horsepower to be successful, but we want to make sure that they have uh, the methods and, and um, strategies that are going to help them to be successful. So that's really what we're focusing on the, on the student preparation standpoint. And we're also uh, coupling uh, some of these efforts with what the teaching center is doing to help faculty to, uh, to continue to focus on student success. So our, our tentative plan really in terms of one, two, and three addresses each of those three issues, right? So the Provost Academy I'll talk about in a minute is a program that we've run for the past two years. It, it uh, coincided with the launch of the Pitt Success Pal Match program. Um, we want to really expand that. We want to grow that to uh, be an even better resource for our incoming students. Uh, the Dietrich School has uh, rebranded and reorganized their student support uh, network within the school under the label of Study Lab, and we really want to to lean in and learn as much as we can about Study Lab and figure out how do we expand that uh, to support students across all of our schools. And as I mentioned, uh, the Center for Teaching and Learning is really going to be a great partner in this in getting faculty uh, to, to figure out what methodologies and in instruction, much like what we heard from Dr. Morton earlier today, are going to be the best fit in building an inclusive and engaging uh, instructional uh, environment for our students. So the Provost Academy, for those of you that, that don't know about it, um, it was an onboarding academic experience that we've run for the past two years. It runs just under two weeks. Uh, we may transition that to be a full two weeks sometime in the future, uh, but it is by no means a remedial 
uh, onboarding experience. It's really what I consider an honors level experience. It was actually motivated by a keynote from a couple of years ago uh, at this very conference, a teaching and assessment conference, uh, when a, a colleague from Georgetown, Randy, Randy Rails, I believe his name is, but Rand, uh, no. So anyway, Randy came in from from Georgetown and talked about a program that they built where they were teaching microbiology to their uh, their summer students as they were onboarding these first year students. And, and that really struck a note with us. And so what we built uh, over these past couple summers really took classes that are upper division elective and sometimes honors college courses and, and structured them to really give an introduction to these students who were inspiring them uh, to, to, to know what their capabilities are. And we're reinforcing that sense that they really do belong and that Pitt believes in them and brought them to Pitt for a very specific purpose. Uh, this was originally marketed to low income and first gen students. Uh, not surprisingly, frankly, the retention of those cohorts has been higher than the retention of our general first year body, which uh, I, I will remind you is actually really an outstanding number to begin with. So we typically retain about 93% of our first year students and participants in the Provost Academy are retained at an even higher level, despite the fact that these at-risk students in other institutions are retained at lower rates. So we really want to take that success and we want to broaden it. We want to expand it to include, at minimum, some of these students that are admitted under a test optional modality so that we can build that sense of belonging and give them the tools to really hit the ground running when the semester starts. Um, what we're going to do ideally is expand from what was typically about six uh, academic experiences. I want to expand that to about 12 and, and cohort those academic experiences. So in other words, instead of having uh, those academic experiences be unrelated to each other, we'll actually have maybe two health science focused academic experiences and maybe two engineering experiences, two business experiences, et cetera, and have uh, then three levels within that experience. Well, where you'll obviously be within your own uh, small group in your honors level uh, specific academic topic, but then we'll expand and have some cohort related programming that will that will try and cross the boundaries across that broader field and obviously then couple that with the overarching programming that's been a hallmark of the Provost Academy so far. Um, the last point I want to make on student supports is, like I said, the study lab has been tremendously successful out of the Dietrich School in recent years. And the, the critical characteristic there is that they want to aim to have students discover the, their own personal keys to success, right? So this is not a remedial focus. This is not, you know, uh, tutoring for students that, that didn't know uh, the subject matter and, and needed to fill in foundations. It's a way for uh, students to really um, look inward and find out what resources they personally need. So the academic coaching has really been a phenomenal uh, tool that they use there. Study skills and resources, workshops, things like that. And then we also empower their peers to wind up uh, being their tutors more often than not. And in that way, we can have students gain ownership and, and uh, build on that sense of belonging because now they can see themselves. They have this role model, this mentor that's another student that's in many cases exactly like them. So these are just some of the efforts that we're working toward uh, to make sure that, that student success is still a hallmark at Pitt and that these students that we're admitting are going to be as successful and, and move on to live lives of impact, just like all previous students from Pitt. Great, it looks like I'm up. So uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Amanda Godley. I'm the Vice Provost for Graduate Studies. And what I wanna to share today is both some national trends in uh, the test optional space at the graduate level, particularly with GREs, and also a very recent snapshot of how graduate and professional programs at Pitt are, are using or not using the GRE. 
Um, so as you can see from some of these headlines, um, there has been in the past year, five years or so, a pretty strong movement to drop the use of the GREs across graduate programs in the United States. Um, some people are calling this movement um, Grexit, like Brexit. <laughs> Something I thought was kind of funny. Um, so this has been motivated by a, a few different um, issues um, and some lines of research that are really important. Um, a number of recent studies have shown very little correlation between GRE scores and success in graduate school. I'll give a couple of examples. Um, in one recent study, GRE scores were not correlated with the number of first authored papers that PhD students published or how long it took them to complete their degree. Another similar study that looked at about 500 PhD students found that even though applicants with higher GRE scores got higher grades or had a higher GPA their very first semester of graduate school, after that, GREs didn't predict which students passed their qualifying exams or graduated, um, again, like how long it took them to finish their program, how many publications they had, or whether they received um, a prestigious grant or fellowship. So um, that's been one, one um, line of reasoning that has, has um, shaped how graduate and professional programs across the country are thinking about the GREs and whether or not to include them in admissions. Another concern is that the test puts underrepresented groups at a disadvantage. So ETS's own data show that women and members of underrepresented racial and ethnic groups um, score lower on the GRE than white and Asian men do. Um, and there's, I can go into the methodology around that because ETS has, has kind of um, pushed back about, um, about how those results should be interpreted. But um, we see from other areas too, similar to what Kelly mentioned with the SAT, concerns about bias that are based in socioeconomics um, and racial and ethnic background. Um, finally, you know, like many standardized tests, the GRE is expensive. Um, it costs about 200, over $200 to take. Um, and the cost of the test, studying for it, and sending scores to multiple schools can restrict access to grad school for um, students who, who are lower income. Um, and I think uh, nationwide, there's also a bit of a concern that maybe there's too much, there has been too much of a reliance on the GRE as an indicator of um, the strength of a prospective student. And there may be other data sources, particularly for graduate programs like academic letters of recommendation and personal research statements that might be, be better sources of information. Um, so with that as a backdrop, I want to share with you um, what this scene looks like right now at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, Joe, if you don't mind going to the next slide. So this um, chart represents data we just collected on GRE requirements across all graduate and professional programs at the University of Pittsburgh. And what you can see is that um, about 82% of programs either um, are GRE optional or do not accept the submission of GRE scores. About 14% are require GREs, and about 4% of our programs require other tests. Um, this, this reflects um, around 250 distinct graduate and professional programs. And um, another important note is that about 15 of the GRE optional programs are temporarily GRE optional for the same reasons that Kelly gave about um, SATs being optional for undergrads uh, or prospective undergrads. Access to the tests have been an issue um, during the pandemic, 
So about 15 programs are right now GRE optional, but are going to reassess after the pandemic. So we also broke this up by PhD programs and master's student master's programs to see if there were any patterns in, in one type of program or the other. And the results are pretty consistent. Um, Joe, if you don't mind going to the next slide. Um, so this shows um, the um, GRE requirements across PhD programs at the university. Um, again, around a bit over 80% either don't accept the GRE or make them optional. Um, about 70, 17% of programs require the GRE. And um, at the PhD level, there are no other standardized tests that are typically required. And then if we look at the next slide, Again, across master's programs, a pretty similar scenario, except um, there are a few master's um, programs that require a different standardized test. So um, where does that leave us at the graduate level? What are our next steps? Um, so if you don't mind advancing to the next slide. Um, so, you know, as Kelly mentioned, at the undergrad level, many of the graduate programs already employ holistic admissions, where they look at the students, all the students' admissions, um, submitted admissions material um, in a holistic way to get a better understanding of the prospective student and um, their academic goals. Um, so without having the GRE as a data point, um, the, the, the notion of holistic admissions um, or, or the way in which it's approached um, needs to be reconsidered. So for instance, um, one important part of this is revisiting admissions goals. Um, what are the goals of um, the, the admissions committee? What, what kind or what, what diversity of students, what um, characteristics of students is that particular graduate program hoping to attract to the school? And in some parts of the university, this has um, included a revisiting of questions about um, better recruiting underrepresented um, minority groups. Um, and other underrepresented populations like women in some fields. Um, another part of rethinking a holistic admissions um, process is developing review criteria. So for instance, the GRE is often used as a data point to look at, um, to look at academic or research potential. But if that is part of the review criteria, are there other sorts of data we could use to make the same assessment about a student's academic or research um, potential? Um, and that ties in with considering alternate data points. So some programs, both in Pitt and across the country, are starting to think about other things that they might ask um, graduate students to submit in addition to um, common letters of recommendation, undergraduate transcripts, and um, uh, personal statement and, and test scores. So are there additional types of personal statements we might want to ask students for, or writing samples? Are there other data points that we could use to review students on the criteria that are most important um, in our programs or to success in our programs? And I think on the flip side of this, as we think about the relationship between undergraduate and graduate, if GREs are not used to make admissions decisions, the other materials that students submit take on heightened importance. So how do we, for instance, help faculty write strong letters of recommendation and understand that letters of recommendation now might carry more weight than they did in the past or need to speak to particular skills and competencies in order for graduate admissions committees to make an informed decision. I think the same goes for personal statements or statements of research goals. They're gonna become more important now 
So how do we provide transparency to graduate and professional students about how those statements are reviewed, what the expectations are for those statements, and how students can write stronger ones? Um, I want to end with just a couple other, you know, really like one other challenge as, as we move forward um, um, in, in, in this movement toward um, eliminating the GRE or making them optional. Um, we don't really know that if that, um, that um, making GRE, GREs optional or not accepting them is going to make graduate school, school more accessible to a broader range of students. We don't know that yet. Um, and there is the danger that in the absence of the GRE, students from less known or less prestigious institutions or students whose undergraduate academic record um, is more mixed could be disadvantaged by the removal of this data point. So that's not to say that that will happen, but I think research on that is still um, fairly new, and we need to both at Pitt and nationwide be sure that um, making GRE optional is having the intended um, effects on, on admissions processes and decisions. So I will stop there, and um, it looks like we have about, um, 15 or 20 minutes left for questions and discussion. So um, there are two ways to submit questions or raise issues. You can do that through chat or you can do it through question and answer. And Kelly, Joe, or I, all of us can answer, uh, each, any of us can answer a question. While we're waiting for some of the questions to come through, I did want to um, let everybody know you might have seen the recent announcement that for um, the undergrad colleges and, and schools and, and regional campuses at Pitt, we did make the decision to go test optional for at least two more years, so through the fall 2023 cycle. Um, I think that it was a great decision by the university leadership to allow us to to try this test optional um, experiment almost for for two more years. I think we're learning a lot, um, and I I do agree with Amanda. We're not sure if it's going to open more doors for students. We hope that it will, um, and but because we don't know, we have to remain hopeful and and just allow for that greater access with students. So we are really excited. Um, it also gives the opportunity to continue to revamp the process. You know, we the decision was made pretty late, um, right before our application opened um, this past summer. And we kind of went in and said, OK, team, we could do it. And, and I have to give a, a huge shout out to the team. They've done an amazing job of getting through these applications and, and making these decisions. But I think it allows a, a huge opportunity to to revamp it even more and, and provide better better service to the students and families and counselors. So Amanda, it looks like we have our first question and it's graduate focused. Uh, the question is, do you are you aware of uh, some of our other schools moving to test optional, for example, like for the MCAT in the med school? That's a great question. So we are keeping our eye on that. In terms of national trends, it seems as if the other um, standardized test that is, is becoming optional at more and more um, institutions is the GMAT, the test that um, folks take for business school. Um, I have not heard of any movement nationwide or at Pitt about the MCAT. But again, we're keeping our eye on that. Okay, I have a couple questions in the chat, I guess, for myself. Um, so Juan asks if the if the Provost Academy will help place students, particularly in math classes. Um, as many of you know, those that are, are uh, affiliated with the math programs at Pitt, um, We've often used the ALEX test, A-L-E-K-S, to help placement uh, of students and or use their math scores on the SATs. So um, 
right now, I believe the, the plan is still to lean on the Alex exam. It won't necessarily be um, coupled to the Provost Academy because we, we don't, we simply don't know how many of the students that we're going to need to place into the proper math courses are actually going to engage in the Provost Academy. But um, so I, I think we should see those two things as separate, right? Really, I, I, I focus the Provost Academy largely on building a sense of belonging, breaking down that imposter syndrome and, and uh, the placement, et cetera, we can do by more traditional means like the Alex exam. Uh, looks like I have another Provost Academy question coming through in the chat. Um, so Dr. Leskold asks if we are going to develop remote versions of the Provost Academy or the study lab. Um, and, and in particular, could we push that into to high schools to help uh, create opportunities for Pitt students to do some tutoring? So th those are excellent ideas. Turns out the Provost Academy this past summer was in fact remote. Uh, and we do anticipate offering essentially a flex at pit version of the Provost Academy this summer. We're hoping that there's going to be uh, an opportunity to have uh, in person as the main methodology of the Provost Academy, but we'll certainly want to accommodate those students that are uh, unable or, or uh, unwilling because of concerns for their health to participate in person we want to be able to uh, allow those remote options. So the Provost Academy has certainly been uh, remote in the past and will likely have a remote portion uh, this coming summer. That again is, is focused primarily on the, uh, the matriculating first year students. So I, I don't know that that portion in particular would work um, in the high school level uh, just because of the focus of what we're trying to accomplish with the Provost Academy. But I do really like the idea of the study lab being uh, extended out into the high schools. And in fact, Investing Now, which is currently housed within uh, the Swanson School, has been leaning on some of the same tools that we actually use for things like Study Lab, Tutor Ocean in particular. Uh, and they're using that to engage with high school students and tutoring programs through the students that are uh, involved in that program within the Swanson School. So that's a great idea. It's something that we're already doing in one school, and I certainly hope to expand it to other schools in the near future. Joe, there's another um, Provost Academy question in the question and answer thread. Um, and this is about exposing students to a broader range of career options related to their cohort track. Yeah, great, great question. So I'll give a little bit of a plug first for recruiting for the Provost Academy. And I don't mean recruiting students. Uh, Bree over in Student Affairs has been phenomenal at recruiting those students and, and mentoring those students. Uh, what I'm putting out a call for right now is recruiting faculty uh, to be engaged, right? We, we've had a really excellent group of faculty in the past two years, but again, it's only been about six to 10 faculty uh, across six programs. We definitely want to expand that, so we're looking to have uh, even more faculty, but career uh, aspects are, are definitely something that I want to put into that mid-tier, right? So we've had um, the full Provost Academy programming, right, where we talk a little about how to be successful at Pitt in a very general sense, and then we had the very specific side where uh, the individual academic experience is focusing on their topical area. And one of the reasons that I want to move to a cohort this year and have several related academic experiences is exactly to get at uh, what your question is, is aimed toward, which is to have that intermediate, those related uh, topics be able to explore a, a wide variety of career options that are related to that broad topical area. So. Uh, that's something I'm definitely interested in doing, but I need a ton of help. So anybody that wants to reach out to me, vpmccarthy at pit.edu uh, is a great way to reach me, and we can uh, talk about how you can help out.
I think we have one more a follow up question from Adam Lee. OK, so Adam is asking uh, about the recruitment material. So Adam wants to roll up his sleeves and help me uh, populate the academic side of the Provost Academy. I appreciate that, Adam. Um, right now, the best place to find some materials, but I'll definitely build out some more, is orientation.pit.edu slash provost hyphen academy. That shows you uh, at least some of the topics that have been uh, offered in the prior two years. Uh, I do have a lot of materials. I, I would be happy to to share it. Um, probably the best way for me to do this is to share it across all of the undergraduate serving associate deans, uh, but then I could also put it on the Provost website. If you go to the Provost website, there is um, there's an undergraduate space there that that I can relay some some recruiting materials. But yeah, anybody that wants to help, even if they're Working as a conduit, right, Adam? I mean, we certainly could use some computer science help if you want to step up yourself, too. But um, as a conduit to getting me more access to faculty, that would be fantastic. I'm surprised we don't have more questions for Kelly, right? We have a sort of a historic know, moment this year with half of almost half of our class being admitted test optional. So Kelly, I'm either going to go ahead, Joe. Uh, can you share with us what the workload difference is, right? You have the traditional mode for the, the students with tests last year. How long did that typically take to look at a single case? And how has that workload expanded? Yeah, that's that's a great question. It was actually just asked to me in um, a meeting Mark and I were at um, recently, and it, it did make me pause there for a moment. If a typical student would have applied with a test score um, and not a whole lot of other information, it probably took about an average of, of say, three, three or four minutes to review the application. By the time we really dove into the transcript, um, their curriculum, things like that. With the test optional, um, because this holistic um, review and the supplemental materials required, and often students, which is great, it, they're supplying multiple types of supplemental information. They're filling out our short answer question, they're sending in their resume to talk about their volunteer experience. They're sending in letters of recommendation from teachers and counselors. It could take, you know, seven, eight minutes per application. Um, and one of the things when I, I gave these quick um, numbers the other day, Mark reminded me that each application is reviewed a minimum of three times. So the application goes through individual reviews, um, and then they are all um, officially approved by me before they're um, sent off to have their official letters sent. So if you take, you know, a three-minute review times three, we're talking nine minutes per application versus, say, an eight minutes um, per review, it's, you know, upwards of possibly a half hour just to review one student. And we are at a record number of applications this year, so we get over 30,000 applications for our first year class, in addition to um, anyone applying for our transfer um, in any of the three terms. So um, we're, we're definitely not lacking in the work, which, which is good. Uh, the applicants are keeping us busy. Um, it is rewarding, but, but it is, it could be exhausting. So I think half of my job this year has been to check in on the team and make sure they're all still hanging in with me. I keep reminding them May 1 is coming, um, and hopefully we land on that, that perfect number and then we can all celebrate in May before we start it all over again in August. So it's been exciting, but but um, definitely more time consuming than the process has been in the past. So I'm going to selfishly exploit the fact that we don't have very many questions. And, and I have a question actually for both of you individually, but I'll give Kelly a break. Uh, Amanda, I, I know that we've had the GRE test optional movement going uh, for a little bit longer than than in the undergraduate space. 
Do we have any lessons learned yet at Pitt? Do we know whether there is an impact on uh, the diversity of the, the matriculating classes or how well those students have done? Or do we have plans on how we might gain that information and data as we move forward? That's a great question. Um, so um, trying to answer them in order. Um, <laughs> um, so although the movement to make GRE optional or not read it at all has been kind of growing in the past five years across the U.S., I think it's it's a more recent movement at Pitt. Um, so there was some benchmarking done a, a couple of years ago, and the difference between the number of programs that were GRE optional then and now has, has changed greatly. Um, so all of that is to say we don't have data yet, but yes, we are planning to collect information, um, data on whether or not this does have an effect on um, both outcomes, like students graduating, um, the diversity of particular programs, but I think also to to speak to what what you and Kelly have um, raised about supporting students who who, for instance, you know, might not um, be really good on on uh, standardized tests or or um, tests like the GRE and SAT and ACT. You know, I, I think that 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 is really a, a an interesting open question at the graduate level, particularly given the studies we have that show um, not very strong correlation between GRE scores and performance, at least in PhD programs. Now, it could be different for master's programs. So I think all of those questions are really important for us to consider. Thanks, Amanda. That, that answer is great, and it actually lends to a question for myself, so I'll even give Kelly a little bit more of a break. Uh, something that I've actually been taking the opportunity to share with the community whenever I get a chance is to talk a little bit about why I said that partnership part with the Teaching Center is going to be so important. And uh, I'm certainly by no means an expert here. I'm an engineer, right, engineering faculty. So, so uh, you know, the science of learning is certainly not my thing. Um, but when you think logically about the, the method by which we screened applications to Pitt in the past, which were largely standardized test based, uh, the fact that we now have roughly 50% of our class that are going to come in explicitly telling us that they're not good at standardized tests, it's kind of interesting to that latter point, Amanda, where you said that the GRE was not predictive of success in graduate programs. In undergraduate programs, our assessments are often mirrors of standardized tests, right? We have large high stakes exams that are sometimes multiple choice or short answer, right? Very different than what you do in graduate school where you're, you're thinking creatively and you're applying uh, your, your foundational knowledge to new exploratory problems. Um, so it makes perfect sense to me that the GRE was not predictive of this really creative activity that happens in graduate school. I think in the undergraduate space, we really need to embrace doing something a bit different with respect to how we assess the learning process for our undergraduates, because it was a self-fulfilling prophecy that we admitted students that were great at standardized tests, and then we assessed their learning with effectively standardized tests, and we said, yay, they're doing excellent. Uh, if we stay in that, I'm a little bit afraid that, that we're not going to uh, see the level of success that we, frankly, achieve, right? We may actually achieve success and measure it completely wrong. So, so I think the teaching center is going to be a, a tremendous partner moving forward. It's going to be really, really important um, that we engage our learners in a way that's going to truly assess how much they're learning. Um, but I, I'll ask Kelly a question since we still have a little bit of time. So Kelly, I love the fact that you're saying that you guys are learning so much more about these students uh, from the application process than you were able to glean 
in prior years. How can we think about taking that knowledge that's now contained in OFA and actually sharing it with advisor, advisors and mentors? Just a little plug for another conference we have coming up in about a month. How do we get advisors and mentors and faculty to learn what you guys have learned about these students that we're bringing up? That is such a great question, and it has been on the top of my mind as we talk about how do we make the process better for next year. You know, we are are, are looking at these students, and we're making notes, and we're, we're seeing the things about them that we're like, wow, this kid is going to be a great fit for Pitt. What they overcame in 10th grade when, you know, their, their house burnt down, and then their parents got divorced, and their whole world got turned upside down, but you never would have known it by seeing their transcript that never missed a beat. But this this student can overcome adversity, and, and we know that they're going to do amazing things at Pitt. Um, it, we, we have talked a lot about, um, we've had, I, I just want to kind of give a shout out to all of the deans and associate deans of our um, five first year admitting schools. Uh, Mark and I have had some amazing conversations with all of them, um, what they're looking for in students. They have offered um, insights of what their currently enrolled students do. We have had um, offers from some of the faculty in the Dean School of Arts and Sciences to help us figure out the um, personal statement, if there's things that they can help us pick up in the writing. So I think as soon as we get through this process, I'm really going to be reaching out to um, several of these people who offered help. Um, I know I got in touch with Amanda and asked her to put me in touch with some people from the School of Education who are doing a lot of research with holistic admissions because it can't just live in OFA. If we saw something in an applicant that we said, you're going to make a great fit for Pitt. We have to be able to at least give that information to the advisors as they're working with the students. So, so all of these documents, these very rich documents, live in these student files that we do pass on to the advisors, but, but maybe they're not seeing the same things we are. Um, I do want to uh, give one more shout out. We did an experiment this year with the Swanson School of Engineering. Um, some of their, their associate dean and, and some of their leaders in engineering did a pilot with us and reached out to students and had what was supposed to be 15-minute interviews with them to try and get an understanding of how they would fit within the Swanson School, especially now that, that we don't have those test scores where um, engineering students were historically um, very high test takers that we brought in in um, students that that historically have very high test scores. So without them, how do we find these students? You know, and so they did this this um, experiment with us and reached out to these students and actually learned that these 15 minute interviews were taking 20, 30 minutes sometimes because they were getting such rich data. So we took those interview notes, we added them to the files as well. So as many of these pieces of information as we can, we're trying to add to the files. But I don't think we're doing, I, we haven't perfected it yet. So that's definitely one of the things as we look at the process over the summer, um, that's, that's high on my list. How do we transfer the knowledge that we gained um, to make sure the advisors, when they're having these personal conversations with the students, that they, they were seeing what we were seeing? So we're still working on it. Um, again, we're always open to help, um, advice. You know, we, we know we're not, it's a brand new process, and we are absolutely not experts at it. Um, and, and so any advice anyone has or help, um, we're, we're always open to that. Well, with about four minutes remaining, I'll, I'll go ahead and keep keeping an eye on the chat. I'll apologize to my colleagues. The lack of questions has kind of put me uh, in a mode that I know my PhD students hate, which is I go and ask questions that I'm just curious about. And when you do that in a defense and you blindside a student, I know they don't like it. So, so I apologize that we're, you know, I came out of the blue with a couple of questions there. Uh, I think this has been a great conversation. I appreciate the insight from both of you. Thank you very much. Uh, I've talked too much, so I will stop now and let one of you guys wrap it up, seeing as we don't have any other questions coming. 
I just wanted to throw in one more thing that I thought of that I think is probably going to help move us forward in this process, at least on the undergrad. We have started a pilot with the School of Computing and Information where we have a position that's 50% within the Office of Admissions and Financial Aid and 50% lives within the school. And they are trained in all things that we do in OFA, admissions committee, the recruitment, the on-campus programs, but they also are trained within the school, so they have some of those very specific insights. Um, we are expanding that program across, hopefully, um, all of the first year um, admitting schools. And I think that's one of the pieces that are really going to help us enhance this ever-changing process. So I just want to finish by saying I'm, I'm super excited that we had the opportunity to become test optional this year. And I've, I've been in the Office of Admissions and Financial Aid for over 21 years. And I will tell you, this is probably one of the most rewarding and probably exhausting, but we'll, we'll, we'll go with rewarding years. Um, that I've ever had here. So I'm super excited that the leadership allowed us to have this opportunity. And I'll just end by saying at the graduate level, um, you know, we're in the midst of what seems like a more permanent transition to test optional. But what I've seen is how some programs have used this as an opportunity to no longer take for granted what makes a strong student or what kind of graduate program they want, but rather use this as an opportunity to rethink, you know, what does our program stand for? Um, what kind of students do we want? What do we want to be known for? What do we value? And so I think there are additional benefits to this transition in addition to opening up graduate um, education to more students. Um, so, um, and of course you, anyone who's interested in that aspect of um, test optional policies is welcome to, to contact me. I'm happy to put you in touch with people across the university who are working on this issue at the graduate level. We've also hosted some events for, for members of uh, the graduate studies community on holistic ad admissions with both internal and external speakers. And my hunch is this is gonna be something that we will be emphasizing over the next few years. So thank you, Joe, for your terrific questions and for moderating this. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, I look forward to lots more collaborations with undergrad admissions. And thank you everybody who came to this session today. We, we hope to continue the conversation. Bye everybody. Bye.